Hey everybody, it's Tim Heidecker. You know me, Tim and Eric, Bridesmaids and uh, Fantastic Four. I'd like to personally invite you to listen to Office Hours Live with me and my co-hosts, DJ Doug Pound. Hello. And Vic Berger. Howdy. Every week we bring you laughs, fun, games, and lots of other surprises. It's live. We take your Zoom calls. Music. We love having fun. Excuse me? Songs. Vic said something. Music. Songs. Music. I like having fun. I like to laugh. I like to meet people who can make me laugh. Please subscribe. No. This episode contains explicit language. Welcome to Mom and Dad are Fighting, Slate's Parenting Podcast for Monday, March 27th, the Video Game Educator Edition. I'm Jamila Lemieux, a writer and contributor to Slate's Care and Feeding Parenting column. I'm mom to Naima, who is about 10, and we live in Los Angeles. I'm Zach Rosen. I host another show. It's called The Best Advice Show, and I'm dad to Noah, who is five and a half, and Ami, who's two and a half. We live in Detroit. I'm Elizabeth Newcamp. I write the homeschool and family travel blog, Dutch Dutch Goose. I'm the mom of three littles, Henry, who's 10, Oliver, who's eight, and Teddy, who's six. We live in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Today, we're diving into the exciting world of video games. We have a special guest joining us, Ash Brandon, known as at Gamer Educator on Instagram. Ash is an expert in gaming trends and has plenty of recommendations to share with us. We'll be answering some of your questions, exploring the latest gaming trends, and talking about the benefits of gaming. And yes, there are benefits. So that'll be up first. And after our discussion with Ash, we're going to dole out some recommendations, and then we're going to wrap up the show by digging into our mailbag. See you back here in a second. Are you looking for a way to entertain your kids in the car, or maybe just a way to wind them down before bed? Then you've got to try Pinna. Pinna is an audio streaming service just for kids that includes tons of podcasts, audiobooks, and more for ages 3 through 12. They offer some well-known stories and so many original podcasts and audiobooks for kids to enjoy. Plus, Pinna is a game changer for daily car trips to and from school, weekend getaways, spring break, and definitely preparing you for summer. Not only will parents love listening, but the kids will beg to turn on Pinna the second they step into the car. It's a routine they can look forward to, and it makes car rides more enjoyable for the whole family. Pinna is offering our listeners one year at $19.99 for a full access annual subscription, a savings of over $50. Just head over to pinna.fm slash promo to sign up and use code mom and dad at checkout. That's P-I-N-N-A dot F-M slash promo. This podcast is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Most of you listening right now are probably multitasking. Yep, while you're listening, you're probably also driving, cleaning, exercising, or maybe even grocery shopping. But if you're not in some kind of moving vehicle, there's something else you can be doing right now. Getting an auto quote from Progressive Insurance. It's easy and you could save money by doing it right from your phone. Drivers who save by switching to Progressive save nearly $700 on average. And auto customers qualify for an average of seven discounts. Discounts for having multiple vehicles on your policy, being a homeowner, and more. So just like your favorite podcast, Progressive will be with you 24-7, 365 days a year, so you're protected no matter what. Multitask right now. Quote your insurance at Progressive.com to join the over 29 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. National average 12-month savings of $698 by new customers surveyed who saved with Progressive between June 2021 and May 2022. Potential savings will vary. Discounts not available in all states and situations. We are back and we're going to dive into Elizabeth's interview with Ash. But before we do, I wanted to talk about our own experiences with video games at home. Zach, are your little ones playing video games yet? They play the PBS Kids Games app, Mm -hmm. which definitely is video games but it looks like video games that were made in like 1999 which makes it feel um kind of less uh abrasive and and busy and kind of overwhelming but no they certainly are playing some some rudimentary video games yeah 
Jamila, are you guys into video games? We're not. We did do some of those PBS kids games when Naima was smaller, but um, she plays Roblox. That is the closest to a video game that we have What's at that? this point. It's an app-based game, um, and you can play it with other people. You can play it with your friends, and there's like a bunch of different games on there. You make avatars, and you can make them have little realistic features like paying extra to change their skin tone and give them baby hair and stuff like that. Yeah, Naeem is into that. But in terms of like a video, she does have a video game console of some sort at her dad's house. I forget which one, but she hasn't pressed. She never asked me for one. She's never been like a big video game girl. What about you, Elizabeth? I'm also curious about you two playing video games growing up. Uh, I never, I did not play growing up. I think we had a Game Boy that we sometimes used like in the car, Mm -hmm. Um, but we never had a game system. The kids have a Switch, but again, I think we own like four games. We're not, we're not huge, like the players, they ask to play every once in a while. um, And they can, we've certainly used it for like trips and for medical appointments and things like that. It, I, it's a crutch that we lean on, but the kids are not as like tied to it as I have certainly seen some of their friends or even just, you know, some families, it's it's more central. Zach, did you play a lot growing up? Relative to my friends, I was kind of a novice, but I did play a fair amount of Mario 1 on Nintendo and then Sonic the Hedgehog on Sega and John Madden 1993, which is a football game on Sega Genesis. So I, I definitely like played a bit, but not to the extent of my friends who like subscribed to the magazines and stuff and like knew all the cheat codes. But no, I dabbled. Yeah, so I wanted Ash to come on because the first thing I noticed about their Instagram account and kind of how um, I got familiar with their work was that they were presenting all these games in kind of ways in which they could enhance homeschooling and education and skills that they're getting out of the game time, which I thought was such a fresh look at using games. And I know that We have lots of families who it is this family bonding thing that they do together. And so much of of the literature and the stuff that's out there, I think, is focused on how negative it is to the point at which when kids play games, video games, we feel like we need to justify it, right? Like, oh, well, this is their free time or this. And Ash has such a fresh take on this. Um, They also give so much good advice on how to make it a healthy part of your family culture. And uh, they were able to tell us a few things that those of us who are video game novices need to watch out for. So let's take a listen to my conversation with Ash. I think sometimes parents feel like offering the video game feels like this thing that should be a reward because getting the kids off of it is so difficult. And you actually have some great tips and things to try for how to end that video game time a lot of what i share like on my page is a lot of strategies that we would use in any other part of parenting and we really can just apply them to games and it will work in roughly the same way but because games i think are not something that many parents feel super comfortable with we kind of don't know how to navigate that aspect of parenting but in reality we can really treat it like any other kind of area where we have to give boundaries so this is where uh you know you know your kid and you know what works well for your kid if your kid does well with warnings and timers then that will probably work well for them in gaming as well um yeah and it also helps to know you know age of kid matters a lot but also the kinds of games they play matter a lot Uh, So one of the things that I recommend to families is you can use the structure of the game to help you end the game. If your child is playing something that is race, race driven and lap driven, it's like, okay, we have time for one more lap. We have time for one more race. Just yesterday, my child was playing a game where it's like you choose an amount of time. And so I told them right up front, you have time for 10 minutes. Do you want to have only one race? It will be 10 minutes. They said yes. And it's a great way, frankly, to talk about lots of concepts that are really important, like paying attention to the passing of time and being able to see how much time is left. And I just give them some occasional reminders of you have three minutes, you have however much time. Something that I like to do as like a wrapping up, which is really helpful for for big 
games where it's kind of hard to stop. There's not an obvious stop. It's hard in the same way that playing in a literal sandbox and getting up and walking away is hard for little kids, right? It's hard for them to leave the playground. It's hard for leaving them to leave the sandbox. It's also hard for them to leave the digital sandbox. So one phrase that I like a lot is, how will you know when you're done? Um, and I love that. That sounds like it puts a lot of res of like power on the kid, but it gives them kind of an off ramp, like a way of, of thinking, okay, I need to use basically my executive functioning skills of figuring out a stopping place. And if you have a really little kid, that's kind of an abstract question. So sometimes what I'll say instead yeah. is, what is the last thing you're going to do today? With my child, I say, okay, you have three minutes. It's time to do the last thing you want to do. Choose the last thing you want to do. Yeah. And they know, okay, I need to wrap it up. You know, that, that's become this shorthand in yeah. our household now. And that's frankly a trick I learned from education with helping kids on huge projects. And it's time to leave for the day. And I'd say, okay, what's the last thing you want to get done today? Or how will you know you're done today or in a stopping place? So just giving those kids, giving kids that way of kind of using that burgeoning executive functioning skill I think can help them a lot. And as we know, you know, if we were reading a book and we're like in the middle of a really great chapter and someone was like, it's dinner, put it away right now. You know, we would st we would also struggle right. with that. We would not like that either. We would prefer a heads up. We would prefer a, hey, we're having dinner in two minutes so that we could get our bookmark and finish our sentence and think, okay, I ended at this page or whatever. So just giving them yeah. that time, giving them like a way to stop um, giving them that off ramp really can do a lot. Uh, you talked a little bit about playing online. This is something that a lot of our parents are looking for guidance on. I think they just don't know what to be aware of, at what age you can allow different things. And I know you don't have like hard and fast rules, but do you have some things that, that parents can think of when they're making these decisions? Like, should I let my kids play this game online? Should I let them, you know, open the chat feature, like whatever that looks like in different games. I, I feel for parents because, you know, as someone who grew up playing games, it is just, it's such a very different arena now um, because so many games either thrive on an online component or easily can, uh, especially games for, yeah. you know, older kids, middle school kids. A lot of those games really do thrive on the social aspect. And that's a big reason many kids want to play them. One thing I have on my page are, is I have, a highlight called like content limits. And I have quite a few posts about how to use parental controls for varying systems and games themselves, because quite a few have really robust parental controls like Roblox and Minecraft have really, really good systems in place for limitations. But like you said, sometimes it's just hard to know where like, where do I begin and what do I even limit? One thing that is pretty consistent in the research is that kids who play games in shared spaces in the research have better outcomes when it comes to things like mm. um, whether or not they develop problematic gaming behaviors. So when kids play in private, they're they're much more likely uh, than kids who play in shared spaces. Yeah. And obviously access is a big thing there. But what I like about shared spaces is that it it allows the adult to sometimes have literal eyes on what's going on, but sometimes to just have, you know, one ear kind of on the conversation. And just yeah. our proximity, as we know as parents, our proximity sometimes just sends a really important message and allows us to kind of hear what's going on and think about, okay, is there something that we need to address? Am I hearing things that sound okay? Uh, is this maybe something we need to talk about? Because the conduct that they have in online spaces might be a way for us to talk about, you know, the way we talk to friends, the way we talk in competition, the way we talk to people we do or don't know very well. And navigating that aspect of like digital safety and online safety is really important. So it is a way to build in the skills. Um, most games with chat settings have ways of limiting the chats so that you can turn them off and disable them completely if they have you know, written chats as well as audio chats. There's often ways of disabling one independently of the other. Most games also have ways of limiting chat and communication to pre-approved people. 
So uh. in games like Roblox, for example, you know, you can have like friends. Same thing with Minecraft. You can have friends right. in those games. So as a parent, you might decide, okay, we're only going to be friends with actual friends. We're going to be friends with people we right. actually know in the real world. And maybe chat is limited to those actual people. And that makes it a lot easier for us to then have those conversations around you know, the way we talk to people online. Because it really is people we know. Um, and I think that's one of those things where as a parent, if your child's getting to the age where they're interested in games with you know chat features and online features, I think this is probably a place where families start to diverge in what they're allowing. And... Yeah. I think this is one of those places where it might be one of those, I understand that our rules are different than someone else's family, and I understand that you don't like it, and I'm not going to change my mind kind of conversations. Um, the other thing I would say is when we do talk about things in video games like chats and staying safe and the way we talk to people in games, we're once again, like you brought up earlier, we're showing them, I care about this and I care about you, and I see this as a valid interest. And that, I think, can make it easier for kids to come to us if they do hear or encounter something that they're unsure of or that feels unsafe. We want our kids to come to us when they encounter unsafe things in the online world. Yeah. And so to do that, we kind of have to set them up knowing that they can come to us in those situations. You know, prior to this conversation right now, I had sort of thought of these shared video games as something that was like, uh, this is silly now because like more dangerous <laughs> than a follower than these other things. When in fact, I'm, I think now you have made me really see how it can be a training ground in many ways for that. A first, um, like sort of, I extend this privilege to you here and this is going to help inform when you're ready to have a phone or when you're ready to have these other things, because it does seem like you can have more control in some sense and be present for this versus something, you know, a more physical phone that you take off with you. And I don't know what's happening. And I like the video games can be played in a in a place, like you said, in which I'm present or I'm there, which offers kind of that safety net and kind of that I know what's going on and I'm I'm here to help you. I I love that. Um I want to do like a bunch of little mini recommendations with you because our listeners just love getting recommendations when we have uh, experts like you on. So do you have like a favorite? Well, first of all, do you have a favorite video gaming system? Well, I would say that like my nostalgia brain is an elder millennial. I will always stay on the N64 probably until I'm like old and sound really, really out of touch. Um, and that's like a point of contention with my spouse and I around like, I think the N64 <laughs> controller is great. And anyway, but for families, yeah. um, the Nintendo Switch is really hard to not get. So my, my elevator pitch for the Nintendo Switch, it is relatively inexpensive. None of these are actually inexpensive. It's, th it's like $300. Right, right. It has a very wide array of games. Nintendo is one of the is a game company where their games are truly proprietary. You you can play some PlayStation games on Xbox and vice versa, and you can play some of them on the Switch. Switch games don't go that way. You know, Nintendo characters okay. are proprietary to the Switch or proprietary to Nintendo. Nintendo thinks hard about how to make gaming accessible and physical and dynamic and changing. And so I love that you can take the Switch and you can play it on a plane and you can play it in your hotel room and you can play it in the car and it's the same experience. It lends itself really well to multiplayer and to family gaming, which I think is really fun and gets families involved together. Yeah. So for most families, especially if you have kids under, say, like 10, I think that's a really great place to start. What is your favorite game for, a, let's say, a newbie family that wants to play a game together? What should they get? Let's say they have yeah, the we're Switch. Gonna assume we'll see what they have that. the Switch. Okay. I really do not think you can go wrong with Mario Kart. It, it, I think, probably ignites a lot of nostalgia for adults. And modern Mario Kart, I'm always surprised how many people don't know this, but the current version of Mario Kart that's on the Switch, Mario Kart 8 Deluxe, 
It allows you to add accessibility features that make it really accessible for very young players. So you can do things like you can change it from joystick function to just holding the whole controller like a steering wheel. So it's like intuitive instead of trying to use your thumb, which is really hard for little kids. You can yeah. also turn on auto steering. So it will keep them on the road no matter what. And you can also turn on like auto gas. So they'll just go. So if you turn on auto gas and auto steering, honestly, they'll win because, <laughs> because they're just yeah. like zooming on the course and they can do whatever they want. They feel really successful and you can play along with them. And that way you're not having to like lose on purpose and they're not getting frustrated. So I think that that is a really good entry level for families. If you want something unusual, though, I would say WarioWare games are so funny. Um, WarioWare Get It Together is the newest one. WarioWare games are these like, they're almost like micro games. You're playing these like five to 10 second mini games that are absurd. Like one of them is like, you're guiding a finger to pick a nose as fast as you can, right? It's like really out there stuff and it goes very, very fast and you can play it with other people. So that's one where I feel like you could play that like with a family on Thanksgiving and everyone's going to laugh and think it's super fun. It'd be so fun. Best game for middle schoolers. There is a little game for the Nintendo Switch. Actually, I think it's for many um, consoles and it's not a game many people would probably choose to play. But I think especially if you have a kid who maybe is interested in things like STEM or coding or like is a kind of logical thinker and likes puzzling stuff out. There's this little game called Baba is You and it's a little indie game and it is one of the most amazing ways I've ever seen that someone has created a game that basically the way you solve things is by using coding logic and it's not like you're actually doing any coding oh, cool. but you're thinking through the logic yeah. of coding and it is very hard like i i'm still probably not even halfway through it and i have to put it down before i like you know have a meltdown um but i think it's a great game that's very very different you know it's not it's not flashy it's not gonna be super bombastic and in your face it's very different kind of game and sometimes with middle schoolers I just like to kind of challenge what they are used to and just like give them something new and different to consider yeah I love that so we've been talking about a, a lot of different video game systems and types of games but not all games are created equal especially when it comes to costing money so how do you differentiate between games that you buy once versus, say, free or pay-to-play type games? I do often praise video games for the way that they intrinsically motivate players. But in the last few years, there's been a huge diversion in kind of which games motivate in which way. And a lot of games that are very popular now are games that are in what we call a free-to-play model. And free-to-play games are very different than a game that you would buy because they don't have money from you right up front. So if I pay my $60 for Mario, that's a lot of money. They have to make sure that I am satisfied and that I'm going to play the next Mario and then I'm going to tell people to buy it, right? So that means that they have to make the game intrinsically motivating. The levels have to compel me to play. It has to be, you know, like a full-fledged game all in one package and I have to feel like I'm getting my money's worth out of playing. But free-to-play games actually do not want you to feel satisfied right out of the gate because if they were if they made you feel satisfied spending no money then they would go out of business. <laughs> so free-to-play games the most famous of which is probably Fortnite um, they find ways of basically incentivizing spending money and they do this in many insidious ways, depending on the game and depending on what country you live in, because we have different laws around this. But a common structure is to have, you know, a free tier and a paid tier for games. We see this in apps that, you know, you pay for access to. But in yeah. games, it might look like, oh, OK, if you don't play for Fort if you don't pay for Fortnite, then you never get to customize your character and you always look random. Or maybe if you log in every day, you get 10 
V-Bucks a day. But if you pay for the currencies in Fortnite, oh, then you get to save your character and you get to choose custom skins and maybe you get 50 V-Bucks every day. And so over time, it becomes more and more worth it to players to feel like they need to continue to pay in. And for kids, they're thinking, oh, but that's all I need. I just need to, I just need 20 more dollars so I can get that gun and then I'll be the best player in the game. And then of course it doesn't work out that way. And then there's another gun or whatever. Yeah. Um, and you're right. For us, we're like, oh, I've seen this before. But for kids, it's new to them. And we all encounter this in some way, right? I remember encountering this structure when yeah. I was trying to do like carnival games as a kid. And I'm like, just one more dollar. Yeah, I'll get them yeah. all. I'll get all the bottles just over this more. time. I just right? need <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> And my yeah, mom know, being like, like no, we're, we're leaving now. But the stakes are much, much higher now. Um, so as a parent, if you do choose to allow those games, you, you may choose to say, we're not going to play these kinds of games. And that is a completely valid thing to do. In my family, we have so far avoided them. You may choose to say, you can play those games if we never spend money on them. Because pretty quickly, kids will realize this game isn't any fun if I can't spend any money on it. You could yeah. choose if you have an older kid to use it as a way of talking about budget. You know, like, okay, if you want to spend your $10 on this, okay. And then you're not going to have $10 for right. something else. Uh, but I think it's important to go in knowing that that is how that game is set up and to kind of go in with that in your head as a parent and think about setting your kid up with some reasonable expectations if free-to-play games or something that they do. Before we go, Ash, how can people find you? So I live mostly on Instagram at The Gamer Educator, and you can find me there. And I have lots of things all about boundaries and games and everything in between. And I hope you'll join me there, and I'm happy to help if, if you need it. Thanks again to Ash for joining us and Elizabeth for leading that conversation. I'm sure our listeners will find plenty of useful takeaways. If you do, let us know. And if you have any suggestions for future guests or topics you want us to address, feel free to drop us an email at slate.com or leave us a voicemail 646-357-9318. We'll take a quick break now and come back with recommendations and mailbag. Stay tuned. This episode is brought to you by Sax.com. Sax.com editors are always tracking the top styles that are trending right now. Tailored blazers and midi dresses are selling out at Sax.com, especially from brands like Veronica Beard and The Row. And Sax.com editors are seeing Loewe's oversized tote on the streets of New York, Milan, and Paris. If you want your own free personalized trend recommendations, Sax.com stylists can do that and more. Plus, there's free shipping and returns all the time at Sax.com. You may know Kelly Rippa from hosting the Live with Kelly and Ryan show for the last 20 years. Now you can get to know her in a whole new way by listening to her podcast, Let's Talk Off Camera with Kelly Rippa. The weekly podcast will transport you inside the unfiltered mind of Kelly Rippa. In each episode, Rippa will dive deep into her life and candidly discuss her marriage, motherhood, career, and how she manages to juggle it all in the public eye. Kelly will talk about everything she could never say on camera. It'll be unfiltered and deep, but most of all, fun. Joined by a rotating group of friends like Matthew McConaughey and Kate Hudson, Kelly dives into a wide range of topics. They'll talk about everything from crazy fitness trends to sex tips, all with humor, heart, and tenacity. So whether you're a longtime Kelly fan or just looking for a great new show, this podcast is perfect for you. Listen to Let's Talk Off Camera with Kelly Rippa every Wednesday on Apple, Stitcher, or wherever you listen to podcasts. Hey there, mom and daughter fighting listeners. Let's talk about Etsy. Etsy is a global marketplace for unique and creative goods. There's no warehouses, just millions of people worldwide buying and selling the things they love. So if you're looking for beautifully made items from independent sellers, check out Etsy. Etsy sellers have everything from statement pieces like rugs and sofas to daily staples like outerwear and accessories. So whether you're a fashionista in the market for a vintage coat or a homeowner looking for a handmade cutting board, Etsy is the place to go. Etsy is committed to promoting creativity and fostering human connection so you can feel good about the purchases you make. 
Shop jackets, jewelry, furniture, art, and more made for all budgets and any occasion. New to Etsy? You can use the code NEW for 10% off your first purchase. That's code NEW. Maximum discount value of $50. Offer ends June 30th, 2023. See terms at etsy.com slash terms. For home, style, and gifts, shop etsy.com. Etsy has it. All right, now it's time for our recommendation segment where we share some of our favorite things that we think listeners will love too. Zach, what are you recommending this week? This is a, a continuation of my, my ongoing quest of finding bridge songs, songs that will get us out of Moana and uh, Matilda now more recently, Matilda the Musical. It's like, there's some great songs in there, but let's let's kind of up the sophistication here and listen to something that the whole family might like. And so occasionally I'll just like put on one of my songs in the car and it'll, and it'll hit. Uh, I described the Mountain Goat song a couple of weeks ago called this year that Noah got really into another artist that the whole family has been really enjoying is this folk singer from Canada her name is Abigail Lapel, and she's contemporary she's making music now but she's one of those artists who who writes songs that sound like they could have been written like a hundred years ago um they're they're just beautiful and timeless they're great to put on before bed they're great to sing along to in the car I would start with the song down by the water great bridge song Great artist, Abigail LaPelle. Very nice. Uh, Elizabeth, what about you? Okay, I have a really fun free event that's from one of my favorite blogs and podcasts out there called Run Wild, My Child. They are doing a treasure hunt on Earth Day, which is April 22nd. Mm. Um, And you can go online, the link's in the show notes, and sign up. Now, it's only, I think, this year in about 20 cities or so. If you're in Colorado Springs, we're doing one here. And an actual uh, treasure box is hidden somewhere. And that morning, you get an email with a clue, and then you get to go try to find the treasure box. But if it is not in your city, or even if you want to sign up and then not participate, that's totally fine. There is also that morning going to be a list sent out of um, Earth Day activities. And if you complete five of them and post some pictures and let them know how you completed them, there are some uh, prizes and stuff that you can win as well. So it's a really fun activity. This will be the second year that they're doing it. If you're in a city with a treasure box, there's all kinds of cool stuff. They have uh, a bunch of company sponsors who are putting stuff in the actual treasure hunt to try to just motivate families to get out. So go check it out. It's called the Run Wild My Child Treasure Hunt. Nice. Sounds very sounds fun. Great. Yeah. What about you, Jamila? My recommendation this week is not family friendly. This is just for the grown-ups. I'm recommending Swarm on Amazon Prime. This is Donald Glover's new show. It's about the, it's about an obsessed fan of a Beyonce-esque pop star. Mm -hmm. And when I say Beyonce-esque, they've lifted so many direct elements from Beyonce's life. I'm so curious to know what she would think of this show. But someone who is a member of The Hive for this pop star, and she starts killing people. Like she starts killing people that say bad things about her favorite singer online. Like she just goes on this crazy killing spree. And you know, I've never seen anything about a black female serial killer. It definitely goes, <laughs> you know, some places that we haven't gone before. And it is just really well acted and it is creepy. And it's got some very interesting cameos. Michael Jackson's daughter is in there for an episode. Whoa. Billie Eilish. As herself? No. Okay. No. Um, but she's got a pretty brief but memorable role. Um, and Billie Eilish is also in it playing the leader of this just wacky spiritual self-help guru type. Um, She's great. And Dominique Fishback, the lead, is just phenomenal. It's so good. It's really bleak. It is really creepy. You know, Naima's dying to watch it. I'm like, absolutely not. Uh, (laughs) Lots of murder, lots of blood, but it is good. It's really something. I want everyone to watch it so we can talk about it. So, yeah, I caught the trailer the other day. It did look pretty compelling. Yeah, it's interesting. There's only seven episodes. I'm not a binge, you know, like, usually I try to take my time and enjoy a series. And I really like, I started at the first three episodes on Friday night and woke up on Saturday morning and watched the rest. Like, 
and since and that's it's all the full season. Yeah, and I can't imagine they're doing a season two, but maybe I don't know. It kind of <laughs> seems like it's you know it wraps itself up. And Malia Obama was a writer on the show. Oh my gosh! So How cool is that? You really want to feel like an old middle aged millennial? Yes. <laughs> yes. Isn't she still like twelve running around the White House lawn? No, that's what I thought. Um, oh, that's what that's wild. Wow. So she was she's she's got to be fresh out of college at this she, point. I think she's twenty two or twenty three. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Malia. Oh, Malia. Uh, great work, Malia. All right. Well, we are nearing the end of the show, but before we go, we like to dip into the mailbag and hear what you guys have to say. Today we have a great letter asking for a few more recommendations. Let's see if we're up for the challenge. Dear mom and dad are fighting. I just finished reading the newest High Low to my kid, and we started that series on a recommendation, I think, from Dan Coyce. She's working on reading the Bob books at Isaac Butler's recommendation, and we own Julian at a wedding, and Julian is a mermaid, thanks to Jamila Lemieux. These are just a few examples. I'd love another segment on book recommendations. Potential themes could be graphic novels, books about loss, and books that are just really enjoyable. Good first books for beginning readers. Great picture books. Honestly, I'll take whatever you all have. Thanks. The Bookworm Whisperer. Uh, thanks, Bookworm Whisperer. Great name. Great alias there. I've got a couple. I think they're pretty well known. But uh, this is what my kids love right now. Richard Scarry's Cars and Trucks and Things That Go. You, you probably read it as a kid. It is so fun trying to find Goldbug on every page. Noah read it for a full year every day. And now Ami is deep into it. Can't beat it. Um, it's probably in its like 50th edition by now. But um, it's also really funny. Like it's really funny illustration. So couldn't recommend that more. Another beginning reader one is The Color Monster, a story about emotions, which is kind of like if, if the film Inside Out was a book. I don't know which one came first but it's just a really great way i love i love um books like this that are a really good jumping off point to have conversations with your kids about like foundational elemental very important things like emotional intelligence and and the color monster does that very well i could go on but let i'll just start with those two and i want to hear what you two are thinking Okay, so since Zach brought up a couple great beginning reader books, and for those younger age, I have a couple that I just love when the kids are starting to read. Um, two of them are actually from Usborn or Usborn. I don't know how you pronounce it, but uh, the My First Readers are really cool because you actually read them with your kid, which I think breaks down if you're working with a new reader one of the struggles is like they don't want to have to read the whole book that seems very overwhelming this has like there are little words that kind of tee up the story on every page Mm. for the adult to read and then uh read like and then words for the kids to read that help move the story along they're really great they're leveled too so of course by the end they're reading more so it starts with one you know book one is like they're reading the word pat 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 tap 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 that moves the story along by the end they're reading half the story my kids have loved those we also love the phonics readers which are cute little rhyming books that are all super silly b makes t goat in a boat things like that um again they are set up so that you can read them together the adult can read the kind of tee up things and then the characters speak in usually sentences that the kids can read so those are really fun i also think the mo willems elephant and piggy books are perfect for new readers they're super fun to read they're kind of graphic novel-y um but the words on the page are pretty simple and so new beginning readers can sound them out there's lots of repeated words so if you read it once they can read and that is in our that is our current rotation um with Teddy, who is just chugging along the the learning to read stage. Um, and they're not boring. So many of the learn to read books are like dumb and boring and they make me crazy. Mm-hmm. Um, what do you got, Jamila? For beginning readers, uh, I'll admit, I don't remember this stage of our reading life as well as I do some of the things that we've read since then. But I really like the I Can Read book series. There's a lot of really interesting titles there. Um, there's some historical fiction. There's um, really cute books like Ty's Travels. We liked Pete the Kitty as part of the I Can Read series, which is the precursor to the very popular Pete the Cat books. 
But one of my favorite ones was Ty's Travels Lab Magic, and it's about two very cute little black boys that are doing science experiments. It's well illustrated, and it's a fun read. Yeah, the I Can Reads have come a long way from when we were young. Yes, they have. <laughs> yes, they have. Okay, Jamila, you probably have some good graphic novels. I think you and I are both in the in the throes of like kids and graphic novels and readers for those elementary grades. I do. I do have a few, not a ton, but a few graphic novels that we like. Uh, one of Naima's favorites is Twins, uh, which I think I gave as a recommendation on the show, Once Upon a Time. It's about twins that are best friends and end up running for office against each other at school. So it becomes this big battle between the two of them and trying to balance what's going on at school with the relationship they have at home. We also love the Babysitter's Club uh, graphic novels, as well as the Babysitter's Club Little Sister graphic novels. The girls of the Babysitter's Club are in middle school, but I think it's a good lower elementary read, I'd say like second, third grade. Um, and then the Babysitter's Club Little Sister books uh, are based on a second grader. So I would say good for first and second grade early readers. Yeah, for that younger age, we've really liked Peter and Ernesto, A Tale of Two Sloths. They're just kind of a silly uh, graphic novel, but really fun. And then I would say that the like upper elementary slash middle graphic novel is like genre is just exploding with great titles. And I came up with so many, but three that um, both Henry and Oliver have read um, either with me or on their own. And then I've picked up that we've loved have been El Defo, which is a graphic novel about a deaf child experience in the classroom with all hearing students. Uh, it's just awesome. Uh, this was our pact, which is sort of this unlikely male friendship. And it's about not fitting in, but it also has all this like adventure and magic thrown in. Um, and then there's one called Witch Boy, which sort of explores some gender roles. They're growing up um, in this world in which there's certain magic assigned to boys and magic assigned to girls. And this boy uh, is going to experiment with the magic assigned to girls. And it is just this wonderful um, book to start exploring that and talking about it and bringing it into your, into your kids um, vocabulary and awareness in a really just beautiful way. Are you doing, Zach, are you guys graphic noveling? <laughs> Not yet, but I'm, I'm very excited for, for that. I think, I think Noah my, is close, and I and I really haven't tried, but I think I definitely should. It's a great, I think it's a great um, idea. She, I think she's ready. Um, I know they asked about books about loss, which is something we get asked about all the time, and um, the Invisible String, which I think both Jamil and I have recommended on this podcast, is excellent. I wanted to add two more for younger readers. One is called One Wave at a Time. This one is really great for acknowledging kind of the range of emotion. It deals with a parent dying, but then also talks about how how those feelings come at in waves at different time. And I think is great if you are further away from the loss and your kid is feeling like they shouldn't be feeling this way anymore. It does a really nice job kind of addressing the, the long process of grief. Um, I also really love the book, and maybe I've suggested this, When Dinosaurs Die, which is like this very straightforward book about death. So if you have kids that are asking a lot of questions or you're just ready to present like, for real, this is what happens, your body stops working. Um, it's, it's a really great great engaging book that answers like all the questions about like physical death uh for older readers um we just finished this is a read aloud called circus mirandus and it is a fanciful kind of magical story but deals with a a relationship with a grandfather and he knows that he is dying and so that is kind of the theme of the book is is his he is dying and these things in this magical world that are happening as a result of that and was a, a really great read aloud, but also had lots of questions from the kids um, kind of processing when, when you have someone that's in a stage that the end is approaching and they know that and the closing out of that relationship. I had a, a book about loss, kind of less explicit about loss of life and more about the loss of home. It's called Lila Tov, Good Night. It's um, like a little children's fable, so it doesn't get explicit at any point, but the undercurrent is a family has to leave their house in the middle of the night. If you want to kind of talk about some of those themes without getting into specifically loss of life, Lila Tov Goodnight is, is a beautiful book. 
two books about loss that I like. Uh, a kid's book about death. I've recommended the kid's book about series many times. It's very comprehensive, easy to read, to the point. And The Sad Dragon, which is from another series that I've recommended a few times. The dragon books are great. They take on topics like ADHD, anxiety, potty training, hygiene. Um, and your dragon is this little something inside of you, you know, that has to do this social emotional learning. Um, and I think this is a really nice book talking about loss for, you know, someone between the ages of maybe five to eight. Okay, they also just asked for like books we're enjoying now, picture books, really enjoyable books. And I came up with a couple there, which is that Teddy's favorite, which actually Jamila experienced <laughs> when we went to the library together. Oh, yeah. He made the librarian <laughs> look up uh, anything by Aaron Reynolds, who writes these books um, about creepy things. There's one called Creepy Pair of Underwear, Creepy Crayon. I think there's Creepy Carrot. Uh, Teddy thinks they're hysterical. We just checked out Squid President. Um, they're just really funny. He really enjoys them. They're easy to read. So that's always fun. And then the big kids have just finished Hello Universe and We Dream of Space, which are both by Aaron and Trada Kelly. And they are just lovely, like, read aloud beautiful books with with um all sorts of different themes definitely more kind of upper elementary middle grades but i enjoyed reading them too so even if you're just looking for something to read and our new favorite picture book is this book called the big umbrella and it's all about like inclusion in a very you know sneaky way it, it is not like preachy but it's about having an umbrella on a rainy day and and basically how many people can you fit under there and how does that make people feel feel it's beautifully illustrated it's just so lovely i mean a consummate favorite in my house is the napping house by audrey wood it's just a beautiful book to set the tone of going to bed it like it's set during a rainstorm and it's simple again this is for for really young kids but I think we've read it a hundred times. Two books that we really love, and these were two of my favorites as a child. The People Could Fly, which is a book, it's an African American folk tales book. It tells stories of enslaved people and some of the ways they were able to survive their circumstances. And I read it in preschool. I've gifted it to many kids over the years. It's just a really beautiful book. And the other one is Mufaro's Beautiful Daughters, which is inspired by a traditional African folk tale. And it's about this man who's got these two beautiful daughters. One of them is very sweet and kind, and the other one is mean spirited and greedy. And there's a king looking to take uh, a wife, and, you know, we're left to discover which of these two girls is going to become the king's wife. And it's just a really beautifully uh, illustrated book that has stuck with me for many years. I remember it from reading Rainbow. Aww. Take a look. I love it's that in a show. Book. Well, thank you for writing in Bookworm Whisperer. We hope you found our book recommendations helpful. Don't forget that your local library and bookstores are also great resources for finding new books to read. And speaking of book recommendations, listeners, we want to hear from you. If you have any great book suggestions, be sure to send them our way at slate.com or leave us a voicemail at 646-357-9318. We also welcome any questions or topics you'd like for us to discuss on the show. And all right, that does it for today. This episode of Mom and Dad are Fighting is produced by Zach Rosen and Mara Curry. Alicia Montgomery is VP of Slate Audio. For Elizabeth Newcamp and Zach Rosen, I'm Jamila Lemieux. Thank you for listening. 